And so we're studying Revelation chapter 2 and 3 right now. And, I, and I'm going to be honest with you, this was really funny. I, I'm working on the message. We, we were so busy this week. It was just so awful. There were so many things going on. And I got all the way done with the message. I sent it out to my team, you know, to get ready for everything. I go off. I run off to do a tree job yesterday, which was a giant mess. But anyway, we, we got it done. And I'm getting home. I'm exhausted. I sit down. And I went, oh, my gosh, it's Mother's Day tomorrow. And I went, oh, my gosh, I know what I'm preaching. It has nothing to do with mothers. In fact, it's one of those really hard messages. And I went, is it too late to change it? And I said, last night, Melissa's my witness. We're sitting there. It's like 7 o'clock. And I'm going, I can call Doug. I can, I can do something. And then I went, well, maybe the Lord had a reason that he wanted this particular message. And then I went, but there's also baby dedications. Lord, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I got to preach this? And, and the Lord said, it's my word. Preach it. <laughs> and I went, okay, boss. <laughs> so I, I ask your mercy <laughs> that today's message is not about mommies. Uh, it's kind of really hard hitting. It's very direct. It's God's holy word, and it is his message for us today. And the reason I say it's his message for us today is because we've been studying Revelation chapter 2 and 3 for a reason. What is this church supposed to be? We've heard the stories about churches that that, that spring up from nothing and become eight, ten thousand 10,000 people, but they don't preach God's word. And we need to look back, and God gave us seven examples and said, look at these churches, look at their experience and history so you can be warned. We talked about that last week. Look at the good things that they were doing and make sure that's what you are doing. And look at the things I warned them about because my word is eternal. It's forever. It's the message for today, for 14.6, for Calvary Chapel, for Radiant, for Hope. It's, it's for his, his kingdom now. We need to hear it. Mother's Day notwithstanding. So mothers, I bless you. I'm glad. I got a mama. I got a caller. It's important. But this message is something we need. So let's pray. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. We are here, Lord God, to honor you above everything and everyone. It was you that created us in the beginning out of nothing. You were the one. We owe our existence to you. And you have communicated to us your word, what you want us to know. You have reached out to us down through the centuries and said, this is how you ought to live because you were made in my image. And when you fail, this is how you need to repent. You have spoken to us and we have an obligation to respond to you because every single one of us from the child we dedicated this morning to the oldest person among us Every single one of us will stand before you and give answer for our lives. I pray, therefore, Father God, that you move among us and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been studying, you know, the vision of this church, why the vision that God has given us, why you should be a part of a church like this. And I realize that some of you are watching me and you're, you're in, well, let's see, we've got people in New Zealand and Australia and Germany, Canada, and uh, everybody else watching. And so if you can't be a part of 14.6, guys, find a church like us because there are lots of them. We need to find a church that is teaching God's word, that's upholding it, that is unashamed. Go there, connect, get involved. We need to be a part of this. That's what we've been studying. Why? Well, one of the key reasons, and this is, this is the, the, the third church in Revelation chapter 2, is that we need a biblical worldview. We really need a biblical worldview. How many of you know that the world 
doesn't have a biblical worldview, okay? How many of you know that your children are not being taught a biblical worldview in the public school system? That's why we're starting a school here, because we're going to teach them a biblical worldview, and you need to be a part of this. Well, I need to explain to you why you need to have a biblical worldview and why you should have your kids in our school to get a biblical worldview, why you as grandparents should come after your, your kids to say, get my grandkids over there in that school to get a biblical worldview and I'll help pay for it because it's important. Why? Why is it so important? Jesus is about to show you why it's so important. Take a look at Revelation chapter 2, go to verse 12. Now, it says, to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and how you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Where Satan dwells. Twice he says this. This is a dangerous place, Pergamos. When you look at Pergamos in history, it was the political capital of Asia, of the province of Asia. This is what's left of it. And when you look at Pergamos in history, it was at that time, listen to me now, the heaviest occult center in the whole world. I mean, all of the temples in Roman and Greek, or, you know, or, sorry, cities in Roman and Greek times, they had lots of temples. They did lots of evil things. Pergamos put them all in the dust. In fact, many scholars call Pergamos the second Babylon. It was that bad. It was an occult center almost like no other, maybe even in history. It was really an evil place. God himself said, this is where Satan's actual throne is. I mean, you don't get any more satanic than this place. It was an evil, evil place. It had the largest altar in the world. It was the altar to Zeus. It was 800 feet above the city, looking down on the city. It was the seventh wonder of the world. And when they worshipped Zeus in this altar, they did things there I cannot describe to you because I would need to censor myself so much. It makes archaeologists ill to know what they did in this place. They had a library there. More than 200,000 volumes. In fact, where we get our word parchment is from Pergamos. Because they had such a huge library. Well, most of their library was about occult practices. Witchcraft, spells, nature worship, demon worship. It was not a good place. It was also the center of Asclepius worship. This is Asclepius. Please notice the snake. Now, Asclepius worship was where we get our word scalpel from Asclepius. That's where we get our word scalpel. Now, the reason is, is that this Greek god was a, was, would come in the form of a snake, was their mythology. And so they had a huge temple there, and people, it was, it was about healing and about medicine. And so people would flock to this place from all over with various different illnesses, and they would worship this god in his temple. And the temple worship was violent. They had smashing drums and cymbals and it was loud and it was, it was designed to get everybody stirred up into a frenzy and they would burn literally. Their incense was opium. So, I mean, these people were high out of their ever-loving minds, whirling around, sex like you can't imagine, giant orgies with snakes. No kidding. They had thousands of snakes in the temple and they would rub the snakes all over their bodies, hoping that the God would give them healing. I'm not making this stuff up. This is where we get this symbol. People don't understand that when you look at the symbol for medicine today, you will notice it has a snake. It comes from Asclepius worship, because this was the center of medicine in the Roman world. 
And to this very day, we use this symbol. It's actually a pagan symbol. You didn't know that, did you? Everybody who's a nurse is going, oh. Okay, yeah, that's true. Now, this city was infested with corrupt, occult thinking. Their entire mindset was wrapped around this. Now, there were gods everywhere, and so you could worship Zeus, you could work, worship Asclepius, you could worship Aphrodite, you could worship Apollo. None of those things mattered. They had a corrupt way of thinking. Every single one of those temples had sex as part of their worship. Every single one. And that is one of the key reasons, guys, that they hated Christians. They didn't just dislike them. They had absolute contempt for Christians. Because Christians had the audacity to say that not only is there only one God, they could handle that. Because you could worship whatever God you wanted to worship in this city. That didn't matter. You want to say there's only one God, we don't care. But the Christians had the audacity to say that sex should only be between a man and his wife exclusively. And that just happened to offend the entire city. So mobs were not uncommon. This is why Antipas was killed. Is because these people had the audacity to say, this is wrong. Now, you've got to keep in mind, this is also big business. You think that sex is uh, new today, that sex trafficking is new today. <laughs> no, they had s- entire legions of slaves in this city that were there for that purpose. That's what they were there for. But they would become Christians and refuse to participate, even as slaves, and would be willing to give their lives rather than to continue. And it created mobs and murder. And public sentiment at that time was to oppose Christianity. And they were under intense pressure. Sound familiar? That we dare to stand up in today's inclusive society. And say, one man, one woman, this is God's design. We're under the same pressure being called bigots and haters because we dare to say the same things that our brothers and sisters did once upon a time and gave their lives for it. Nothing has changed. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing has changed. But you know, the enemy learned something. He figured, now this is important, get this. He understood that violence against Christians in Pergamos didn't work. In fact, the more violent that Satan stirred people up, the more Christians, more people got saved. He went, well, that's not working. I know what I'll do. See, Satan's not a very original thinker. What I'll do is I'll simply corrupt their thinking. If I can corrupt their thinking, then that will corrupt their behaviors And if I corrupt their behaviors, then they'll be ineffective. And I can go about continuing to destroy every human being on this planet. This is the reason, guys, that Jesus identifies himself in this scripture as the one holding the two-edged sword. Now, what's the two-edged sword? It's the word of God. Those of us that have been studying long enough know that there are plenty of scriptures that say that God's word is like a two-edged sword. In fact, you're going to read in a few verses where Jesus says, the sword of my mouth. What he's saying is, now this is important, is that God confronts, listen, listen, God confronts the corrupt thinking that this world is trying to infect you with. He confronts the philosophies, the corrupt philosophies of this world, the corrupt arguments that try to twist your behaviors. He confronts that with his word. He confronts it with the Bible. In other words, the Bible is the standard for what is right, what is wrong, what is real, what is not real. Everything else falls short. That's what Jesus is saying right from the beginning. I am the word. I hold the two-edged sword. I am the standard. And I know that these, they're, they're out there trying to corrupt your thinking, and I'm going to confront that with my word. See, this is extremely important. Listen to me. Corruption 
doesn't come from your environment. Let me say that again. Contrary to, to thinking out there today, everybody out there says, well, if we, you know, it's the environment. That's what causes people to be uh, delinquents or sexual deviants or something of that nature, right? You've heard that. You know, it's just because they're in a bad environment. Well, if you think about that for a minute, it's simply not true. You ever heard of the Menendez brothers? Okay, affluent, went to private schools, had everything, brand new cars, murdered their parents. So you can be from an affluent neighborhood and murder your parents. You can be from a very poor, run-down neighborhood that, you know, broken home, all of that stuff, and still murder your parents. So it's not coming from your environment. It's not coming from your genetics either. No, no, no. It's coming from a corrupt heart. And that's human. Whether you're rich, poor, tall, short, male, female, it doesn't matter what color you are. If you've got a heart and it's human, it's corrupt. And that's the truth. And God says, I'm going to confront this with my word. Now, it also says here that Satan dwells in this place, in this place. Now, what does he mean? He's saying, look, satanic influence is based it on, on twisting your thinking. That's what Satan's going to do. People get worried about curses. They get worried about, you know, occult influences. Look, don't worry about that stuff. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. You see, Satan's going to attack you in your thinking. That's why you desperately need a biblical world view, because he's going to attack your thinking thinking and that's what leads to evil actions it's not your environment it's not your genetics it's your thinking that's what's going to happen and you got to have the right kind of thinking now these guys somehow managed to hold on to their faith even under that kind of influence they had managed to hold on to it but there were some problems there were some problems now you see this is this is extremely important God did not give them any quarter. Did you notice that? He's not saying, oh, man, I know you're in the place where Satan dwells. I'll give you a little bit of extra room. Do you see that he doesn't do that? He expects you to stand for him and his holiness and his image, even if you are right in this place where Satan himself dwells. He doesn't give you anything less. He doesn't expect anything less. Yes, the bar is very high. And you're not going to be able to reach it apart from his spirit. Amen. Not a chance. You're not going to get there. Neither am I. So, the thing was, they had managed to hold on to it, but there were problems. And those problems were based, listen, on a confusion over what was true. You're about to find that out. Because back then, even as we are now, everyone was basing their idea of truth based on their opinion. I think that Zeus is better. I think that Apollo is better. I think that this, they had all kinds of opinions. There were all sorts of temples. There were all sorts of ideas, all sorts of philosophers. And everyone was running around thinking, well, my opinion is better or your opinion is better. See, back then, even as, as it is now, everyone was cool with whatever you wanted to believe except Christianity. It's the same then as it is now. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the only way. I'm the truth, and I'm the life. That's why we named our church that, because it's all about him. It's not, we're not going to take a little bit of this philosophy and a little bit of that philosophy and a little bit of this, mix it all together and say, ooh, look, isn't it pretty? No, it's not. We follow Jesus and him alone. He is the word. That's what we're going to do. And guess what? That was offensive then, and it's offensive right now. Now, we shouldn't be intentionally going out and goading people. We shouldn't be intentionally going out and being obnoxious, but face the facts. If you're going to follow Jesus, you will be offensive. I don't care how you say it. It's going to be a stumbling block for this world. Now, look, I know that can be harsh. I understand that. 
But that's why Jesus said, my word is like a sword. It cuts you going out. It cuts you coming back. In fact, the Bible says that my sword is sharper than any other sword, and it will cut you right to the soul. Yeah, that's harsh. But how many of you know that if you've got cancer, scalpels can be harsh? And you need one, or it will kill you. And Jesus is not afraid to say, I will cut that out of your life. I'm going to cut that right out of your life. What he's really trying to say, and this is what I think we all need to understand, is that we need to have a biblical worldview. We need to understand God's word and how to apply it. Now, what's a worldview? When you, how you think about the world, how you think about how things should be, how you make sense out of the world comes from your worldview. Now, what a worldview is, is it's a connected set of beliefs about how things are, about what are real things, what are real things like, what is true. You have a connected set of beliefs, and we call it a worldview. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody does. Doesn't matter how old you are. Now, here's the key to a worldview. Now, listen carefully. Most of the time, your worldview is not taught, it's caught. So you spend 2.8 hours every single day watching television on average. You spend about 40 minutes, 45 minutes a week listening to God's word coming out of my mouth. Who's winning? Well, let's hope so. But you're putting more influence if you're watching 2.8 hours of television every day because most of the time we catch it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We pick up things unconsciously because we hear it over and over and over and over and over again until we just accept it. Here's one. This is very common in the world today. How many of you know that uh, there is a constitutional separation of church and state? No, there's not. But you've heard it so many times, you believe it. You've incorporated it into your worldview. That is not written into the Constitution of the United States of America. There is no separation of church and state in the Constitution. In fact, the words separation of church and state come from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson who was writing to a group of Baptists who were worried that the United States was going to start an, an actual church. And they were worried. And he said, no, 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 no don't worry about that. that w- there's a separation of church and state. That, don't worry about that. And he calmed them down. But it's not in the Constitution. In fact, in the Constitution, it affirms the Creator. It affirms the Bible. But you see, we've incorporated it because we, we catch these things. We hear it. Long enough, over and over and over and over and over again, we hear these things. Now, here's what was happening in that church at that time. These folks were being infiltrated or infected by teachers that were bringing in twisted ideas. And they were bringing it in to infect their worldview. Does that make sense? They'd bring these ideas in. They were teachers, like I'm a teacher, and they would teach it to the congregation, and they were leading people into compromises. They were leading people into immorality. That's what they were doing at that time. And Jesus is saying, I need to confront that. And the way I'm going to confront that is through my word. Now, listen carefully. There are plenty of churches out there, I know them, who will tell you, we follow God's word so long as it works for us. So long as it's convenient. So long as it's been translated correctly in our view. Okay? That's what they're going to say. I have personally met Episcopal priests who have looked me right in the eye and said, we don't believe the whole Bible is inspired by God. We'll teach the Koran if it works. We'll teach Scientology if it works. I... Their mouth to my ear. I'm not making that up. And Jesus is saying, no, the standard is my word. That's how I'm going to confront it. That's why this Bible is, or this church is so into chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That is why, did you know that those nursery kids in there, the little ones, this big, we have something called cradle roll. 
where we're literally teaching them the word of God. We're telling them scriptures. We're singing scriptures to your children before they can even talk. Because we are committed from nursery all the way up to teaching kids a biblical worldview. We're committed to teaching you adults a biblical worldview. And that is the key. Listen, we need to constantly, every day, learn from the Bible. Every day. So that we can be committed to living by that biblical worldview. It's absolutely crucial. Now listen to me. Here's how Satan was trying. Listen, now this is going to This is going to hurt. This is going to hit you in a very personal place. And I understand that. That's why I was afraid to give this message on Mother's Day with baby dedications. But the prime, listen, the primary way that Satan is going to try to twist your worldview in this day and in this age is exactly the same as what he tried to do at Pergamos. And he did it through sex oh he said the big s word yes and i was a biology teacher so i actually know about this stuff let's go to revelation chapter 2 verse 14 but i have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of balaam who taught balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, here's what Jesus is trying to say. The way you're being corrupted, the way your worldview is being twisted is the same way that Balaam advised Balak to twist the worldview and the thinking of the Israelites long ago. And not only is it the same thing, but you have these Nicolaitans among you that are promoting this doctrine of Balaam. Now, what is this doctrine? Now, if you go to Numbers chapter 22 uh, through chapter 24, I'm not going to get there, I'm just going to summarize it, you will see what's going on. Now, Balak knew the children of Israel were coming, And he thought, i got to destroy these guys. So he went to the local sorcerer. His name was Balaam. And he said, listen, Balaam, I need something from you. I'll pay you to go throw a curse on these people. Now, Balaam, being a greedy dude, said, okay, pay up. I'll do it. So he goes over to look at the children of Israel, and God pulls a fast one on him. I love it. Balaam opens up his mouth to pronounce this curse, and out of his mouth comes this great big blessing. He's like, whoa, what happened? Three times, three times he tries to pronounce a curse, and God goes, watch this, I have control of your tongue. You think you could curse my people? Watch what I'll do. I'll change the words as they're coming out of your mouth. You'll be thinking one thing and saying another, because I am the living God. Right? So Balaam finally figured it out. There's something spiritual going on here, okay? And he went, okay, this isn't working, Balak. I'll tell you what. Here's what you do. See those Moabite women over there? They're drop-dead gorgeous. All you got to do is go over there and get them to entice the men of Israel to have sex with them. Now, how many of you know that that's not terribly difficult to do? Because men like to have sex with women. We're designed that way. And when you've got available ones, he said, Balak, listen, you get those available, those girls over there, they'll entice those men into sexual immorality and that'll get God's curse on them. And it did. Because when the men corrupted themselves by having, uh, uh, committing fornication and adultery with these women, those women also said, come and have sex with us at our shrines to our gods. Up on the hills here. And God's curse did come down because of that. And what God is saying, listen carefully. Pergamos, this is what Satan's trying to do to you. He's trying to entice you the same way through sexual immorality. He's trying to entice you into getting a curse from me. 21st century church, 
He's trying to do the same thing. Nothing's changed. We live in a sex-saturated culture. And if you think I'm kidding, I have a statistic here that every second of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every second, 28,258 people will click on a porn website. 28,258 every second. 72% of those will be women, 28%, I'm sorry, 72% will be men, 28% will be women. Our culture is saturated. An erotic novel called Fifty Shades of Grey, which just came out, which is, by the way, is female pornography. You don't think so, but it's the same thing. Sold 150 million copies in 37 languages. So do not think for a minute that we're not under the same pressure because we are. See, back then in Roman and Greek times, sex was the center of their religion and it was the center of their culture. Sound familiar? In fact, it was seen strange in those days. Monogamy, what's that? I'm, I don't get it. Did you know that today, as of this morning, three out of every four births will be outside of wedlock in this country in the next year? Three out of four. Okay, because we're in the same place. Now, there was a Roman statesman named Cicero. He is quoted in a commentary uh, written by Barclay, and he said this. This is a quote from a Roman 2,000 years ago said, If there is anyone who thinks that young men should not be allowed to have sex with many women, he is extremely severe. I'm not able to deny the principle he stands on, but he contradicts not only the freedom our age allows, but also with the customs and allowances of our ancestors. Now, you might as well just change the name from Cicero to Hefner, saying the same thing, right? I mean, we have gone from 20 years ago where being in porn was a shameful thing to now we have college co-eds that are being celebrated on Sunday morning news programs because they used pornography to pay to go to Duke University. And they're being celebrated for their their strength and their, their willingness to, to, to work hard, to pay for school. <laughs> hard work. Here, let me take this off. That's hard. That's what they're doing. We're in the same world as Pergamos. See, there are many people today that claim to be Christians. They claim to hold to the faith of Jesus Christ just as these people did. They held to his name. But they convince themselves that sexual activity outside of a man being married to a woman is okay. They convince themselves that I'm going to get married anyway, so it's okay. They convince themselves that homosexual activity is perfectly acceptable because they are listening to Balaam's advice. Do you see? It's the same thing. Now, being saturated in our culture with sex does not give us an excuse at all. Doesn't give us an excuse. It didn't give them an excuse. God did not give them a, a pass. He said, I got some problems with you, bye. Come and listen to me. And we need to do the same. Listen, being saturated by this sexual input all the time what a girl should look like watching the television set, how she should act, what a man should do because of what all of his friends are doing. Everybody's doing it. Everybody wants it. I might as well do it. And now we have Christians who are openly sexually active prior to being married as if it's no big deal. I mean, we're getting married and we already live together. Okay, you're in sin. Oh, let me say that again. If you're living with someone, sexually active with them, and you are not married to them, it is wrong. Get that on tape. Now, will that offend a lot of people? Yes. Do I care? No. Now, 
worse. Now, this is worse. Listen to me because I don't want you to go to the other extreme because there is another extreme. And that extreme is, is that suddenly sex is the greatest of all sins. How many of you know it isn't? It's not the greatest of all sins. The greatest of all sins is to reject Jesus Christ. That's the greatest of all sins. Giving in to that powerful drive and making a bad choice is a sin. It is not the greatest of sins. We need to understand that because there's too much fear. There's too much guilt. There's too much pressure feeling like I can never live the Christian life because I'm always thinking about it. Because I always want it. Guess what? If you're always thinking about it and you always want it, you normal. Let me say that again, particularly if you're a guy. Okay, you're going to be thinking about it all the time. Welcome to the human race. God has a solution for you. It's called marriage. It really is. It's a great solution. It really is. In fact, take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, if you don't believe me. It says this, but because there's so much sexual immorality, I mean, nothing's changed, each man should have his own wife. And each woman should have her own husband. That's how it works. The husband should not deprive his wife of sexual intimacy, which is her right as a married woman. Nor should the wife deprive her husband. Pay attention. Don't deprive one another. You guys need to be having a good time if you're married. The wife, I'm sorry. Hey, did did I misread this? The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband also gives authority of his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Let's just be, that's the solution. The only exception to this rule would be the agreement, the agreement of both husband and wife to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that they can give themselves up more completely to prayer. Afterward, they should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt them because of their lack of self-control. The Bible is straight up. Look, I know you're going to have a self-control problem. Get married. Knock yourself out. That's the solution. But I'm not married. Trust the Lord. You're just going to have to wait. I'm sorry, but I don't like waiting. Well, look, I don't like waiting either. That's when you give it over to the Lord. Give it over to prayer. That's when you get accountable with other Christians so that you're not alone with somebody of the opposite sex. Bad plan. So, listen carefully, married people and unmarried. Within heterosexual marriage, the Bible teaches be sexually fulfilling to one another. That's what it teaches. Be sexually fulfilling to each other. And to unmarried people, it's clear. Do not have sex at all. Period. Zero. None. Because anything less than this is compromising. And that's why God says, I hate what the Nicolaitans are doing. Now, who are they? The Nicolaitans. Now, what the Nicolaitans were, you can look at the word Nicolaitis here in Greek, and it means, Nico means to rule, dominate, or destroy. And the word Laetus means, uh, or la- laity, or people. In other words, what, he, what these people were, they were followers of a guy of Nicholas of Antioch. And here's what they were doing. They were teaching. They were spiritual leaders. They were were using their influence. I'm a spiritual leader. You should listen to me. I have authority over the people. Do you see that? I have authority, and I'm going to use an intimidating, this is important, intimidating, browbeating argument that says if you are not in favor of sexual immorality, then you're not really a follower of Jesus because after all, Jesus taught us to love each other. And that's what they were doing. They were standing up saying, I'm a spiritual leader. I have authority. And you should allow fornication because after all, God is love. You should allow homosexuality because after all, God is love. That's what they would do. The Nicolaitans were preachers. They were saying that sexual immorality was okay. Fast forward to this year, to this man, Rob Bell, and his friend 
Brian McLaren. Now, Rob Bell was the pastor of a mega church. The reason he was the pastor of a mega church was because he said a lot of things that people wanted to hear. But when he started saying things like this, 3,000 people walked out the church doors in one day. So he finally had to quit before he destroyed his own church. But here's what he had to say. He's a best-selling author. And by the way, I didn't just read this quote. I went to the internet and heard it with my own ears off YouTube. I wanted to make sure he really said this. He said, I believe God is pulling us ahead into greater and greater affirmation and acceptance of our gay brothers and sisters and pastors and friends and neighbors and co-workers. I am for fidelity. I am for love. Whether it's a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, or a man and a man. I think the ship has sailed, and I think that the church needs to just, this, this is the world that we are living in, and we need to affirm people wherever they are. That is a direct quote from a best-selling pastor in your country right now. This man, and I will tell him to his face if he calls me up, is a Nicolaitan. And I'm not ashamed to say it. Because he's a self-described spiritual leader that pretends that sex outside of a heterosexual marriage is acceptable to God and that we need to teach it and affirm it. And he condemns those of us that teach that that is wrong. Rob? Rob? Give me a call. No, you won't give me a call. Because I know that there are other pastors that are much more important than I am that have already tried to call you. I feel sorry for you, brother. I really do. You've fallen into the Balaam's trap. You need to repent. I care about you enough to tell you that. I care about you enough to tell you that. Because here's the key, brother. Look at this. We need to choose the biblical worldview that sex should only happen between a man and a woman who are married to each other. Period. Period. No compromise, no other way. Now, that's a biblical worldview. Take a look at verse 16. I'm going to try to wrap this up relatively quick, but i got some important things to say here. Because Jesus said, repent, turn around, or else I will come to you quickly, suddenly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, with the word of God. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches, pay attention is what he's saying, even in the 21st century. Because to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Oh, that's gorgeous. I will tell you who your real self is. Now, what he's trying to say here is repent means to turn away. And what he's saying is he's saying, look, that word repentance is not just for non-Christians. It's for those of you that hold fast to my name. To repent means if you're a follower of Jesus, you turn around from the way the world says to do things and you come follow me. That's what you do. You see, they had allowed some of these things into their lives and just like them, we need to rid ourselves of sexual compromise, period. There are some of you who are married men. And you play little sexual fantasies in your mind about being with somebody else. You need to repent. There are some women in this room who are so unhappy with their husband that they live, eat, and sleep with whatever's in the tabloids or whatever romance novel they're reading or whatever soap opera they're watching going, I wish my husband was like that. When you're wishing your husband was like that, it's the same as some guy looking at a naked picture and going, I wish my wife looked like this. It is the same. And you need to repent. You need to repent. There are some young people in this room. You are unmarried, and you are one of those 28,000 that are looking at porn. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to turn away but listen to me. There are some of you that are struggling with same-sex attraction. You need to repent. Now, here's the hard news. It won't get any easier. You're going to need to learn to depend upon Jesus Christ. You may be a married man in a happy marriage. You are still vulnerable to your flesh. You must be strong in the Lord. 
There are some of you that are going, I have same-sex attractions, but I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to resist those things. It won't get easier, friend. You have got to learn to find what you need in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Do not give in to the lie that you might as well just give in. Do not give in to that lie. You see, the truth is, listen, guys, the truth is, we should all be living a lifestyle of repentance. We're constantly turning to God. How many of you know that you're probably going to sin today in your thinking? You're probably going to get mad and drop an F-bomb and have to go to the Lord and go, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Everybody here is going to have a naughty thought. Probably today. We have to live a lifestyle of repentance. That's what he's saying. And he's, now, this is the key. He's saying, look, I will give you, if you make the choice, listen to me, if you make the choice to resist those urges, I will give you of the hidden manna. That means I will sustain you. I will give you the strength that you need to defeat this. But listen, if people tell me all the time, oh, pastor, if I just had the strength, I would go do that. God says, go do. I will give you the strength. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you choose to repent. You choose to turn away from the world's ways. I will sustain you. I will give you that manna. And in addition, in addition, in addition, listen, that white stone. See, back in those days, in courts, the jury were given two stones. One was white, one was black. One said acquitted, one said guilty. And at the end of the trial, they would throw their stone in the bag. And if they were white stones, you were acquitted. And Jesus is saying, I will give you a white stone. If you turn to me, I will acquit you. I don't care what you've done. My blood is strong enough to wash it all away. I don't care where you've compromised. Homosexuality, I can wash that away. Did you know that? You know, infidelity, I can wash that sin away. Fornication, I can wash that away. Pornography, I can wash that away. My blood is strong enough to wash it all away and give you a new name that's just between you and me. A real intimacy that says this is your real self and I have washed you clean as the new driven stuff. That's what he says. That's what he says. And my friend, that's what he means. And here's the last, the last key is that that biblical worldview is that everyone has sinned. So everyone needs to choose that lifestyle of continually turning towards God and his ways. And when you do, he will wash you clean. Let's pray.